Welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Cablevision of Urbana-Champaign, nestled amongst the cornfields surrounding the University of Illinois, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Once again, I'd like to thank the people here at Cablevision of Urbana-Champaign, without whom this show would not have been possible. Our guest this, this week was born in Munich and was raised in the old world tradition. His father, a self-taught mathematician, proved the four-color map theorem. Our guest practiced violin for hours in the morning before going to school until he discovered his parents couldn't tell if it was live or Memorex. As a child, he liked to play with rodents. Our guest began trying to build computer music machines at 12 and attended Uni High, the University of Illinois' elite lab school, whose alumni have, up to the current time, received four Nobel and two Pulitzer Prizes. Our guest worked his way through his PhD in computer engineering at the University of Illinois by programming and designing equipment for the computer-based education research lab. His hobbies include skydiving, skiing, and scuba diving, as well as building musical instruments. Our guest is currently head of the Searle Sound Group, where he has written lots of music software and designed a number of advanced music synthesizers. One of his recent projects is the Zephyr Computer, which emulates a control data, data which emulates a control data cyber with performance near their top of the line offering. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome our <laughs> without further ado, I'd like to welcome to our program a computer engineer and instrument builder who's responsible for having the balcony windows in his high school welded shut, Dr. Lippold Hocken. Hello, Lippold, and welcome to High Tech Heroes. So, so is it true they're gonna cl close Uni High if they don't get some funding pretty soon? Well, I, I hear that in the mail every once in a while. Well, it's too bad, you know. I think John Bardeen's probably got enough money, he could probably keep it open forever. <laughs> or uh, George Will should give him some money, maybe. Anyway, um, so, uh, so you were a violinist, you used to practice with a tape recorder? Yeah, yeah, my mom required that I played violin, but unfortunately she also had five other kids to worry about, so we had to record our violin playing on a tape recorder. Oh, and then she'd check it. Right, right. So. But she'd hear you doing it. Yeah, she does doing it, but you could always duplicate tapes. You know, there are all sorts oh, of methods see, for, for getting around the problem. So you started off in electronic music sort of uh, early, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what did you bring to show us here? Okay, well, this is a, a music notation program for standard music notation. Uh, this is actually a program that I started working on when you were head of the Searle Sound Group back oh. in 1974. That's a long time ago. Uh, back when I was in high school. Now, this latest implementation is for the Macintosh. Uh, and uh, the, I worked on this together with Dorothea Blostein, who is at Queen's University in Canada. Dorothea Blostein, is that your sister? That's my sister, my international collaborator. Mm -hmm. And uh, this piece that's up here, this was a piece uh, that my brother composed for me. I recently got married. Congratulations, by and, the way. And uh, thank you. And so this is part of a piece for it. This has uh, several different parts here. That's a voice part, a viola part, a harp part, organ part, and a uh, organ pedal part here, and uh, since you can't see quite a whole page on the screen here, you can scroll around and see the different uh, parts of the music here. Well, go I don't know, I don't, I don't see, let's see, we should get a picture of the screen actually, but um, yeah, there we go, now scroll it. Okay, so that's that there. And that works just like a Macintosh window. That's right. It is a Macintosh window, <laughs> yes. Okay, and so you have a bunch of notes here. The editor allows you to do lots of different things. One of them is play back the music. Mm -hmm. I'll play back a little bit of it here. This is playing on a piano sound. This was actually performed by a harpist, violist, organist, and, uh, and a bunch of singers mm -hmm. at the wedding. So you can see I'll play with the master. It's a really bouncing ball. So forth. That sounds like a real piano. Yeah, yeah it's just a MIDI synthesizer. Really? Um, and uh, let's see, in music editing, there's a bunch of different things you need to do. Well, One whose the, MIDI synthesizer was that? Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Yamaha's. Oh, well, let's talk about what we're, what's actually hooked up here. Okay, there's a Yamaha music synthesizer behind oh. the table there. 
And this is a standard MIDI keyboard. A Kai, huh? Yeah, and okay. this is a Macintosh, and that's the monitor for it. And uh, this is a signal processor which we built. Um, What's that called? It's called the Platypus. Uh-huh, okay. And uh, that's about all that's hooked up right now. Okay. Okay, so anyway, when you enter music, uh, when you do music processing, like you do word processing, you have to first enter the notes. In this program, there's two different ways to do that. One of them is you can select the note values down here and then play all the chords you have. So you're telling it the note value for each chord. Right. Or you can play along with the metronome, and it automatically figures out the chord values. What do you do, count four at the beginning or something? Or? No, it plays a metronome, so it knows. Oh, what, it plays the metronome. Right, okay. it knows what the beats are. Now, it might make mistakes, or you might make mistakes playing, and you can go back and fix those up. Sure. Then once you've got that all done, there's a bunch of other things you add to music. For instance, you add this text, or I'll give an example here. If you want to add a crescendo hairpin, uh, then you select a starting okay. note here. And, or say I want to add it on the uh, viola part here. I can just draw in the hairpin that I want here. And say do a decrescendo now from that's the fortissimo. That's a decrescendo, note. right. And then, well, different things happen. Like here, I'm overlapping some of the notes. So I can uh, pick up the staff lines here and move them down a bit so that they get out of the way of the notes. Oh, so the representation. Um, you can even change the... Uh, yeah, you have to be able to change the layout of the thing. The whole layout. And that's I can amazing. move my fortissimo around here if I don't like where it's at. You can do all sorts of such things. It's, uh, you can't do any of that in, in uh, anything that I know of. Well, there's a lot of different programs out there, but just like certain word processors are good for certain things, so certain much, music print programs. So how much do you guys sell this thing for? Uh, well, you can get a uh, free demonstration version over, uh, over the Internet by anonymous FTP. So what? So they have to ask you for a copy? Right. They can send me email. And what is that? L. Hawken? L-H-A-K-E-N at uiuc.edu. Okay. So uh, then you get the manual and the program and all that. Um, Here's an example of what the music printout looks like. Oh, cool. This looks is like uh, yeah, this is a, a postscript print. And of course, it's much higher quality than what you can display on the screen. This actually is just part of a score. This yeah, is the organ part here. here. Can we, maybe we get it closer in there, because this is really high quality. This looks just like, uh, it looks just like printed music. Well, that's it's what got, it is. It's got, all the, uh, it's got all the symbols I've ever seen and more. And one of the even a K clef in here. Right. There's well, this is an organ part, but the viola part's printed as uh, small notes as cues above it, so that the organist oh. knows what's going on. That's one nice thing about this program. It's got all these features to uh, extract uh, parts from scores like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I want to uh, go ahead next. I want to show uh, some music synthesis. Okay. Good. Well, let's do it. So um, I'm going to load up that program. Oh, okay. So you want to okay? You want to load that now? Sure. Okay, why don't we show, while it's loading, we can show your uh, new keyboard. Okay, I gotta, uh, gotta get start started up here. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna go ahead and get the other stuff here, though. Well, I'll, I'll show the uh, next thing I'm gonna show. This is the signal processor. Okay. Um, why don't you hold this while I press some more? Sure, okay. Uh, so this looks like about, uh, what, maybe 150 integrated circuits? Yeah, it's a uh, standard wire app on the back. You can see it's. Uh, In fact, they're numbered here. Well, not all of them. Oh, the back. Well, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so that's the, a, that's the, the Platypus computer. Like that's the same the thing that's in the box here. Okay, so that's, this is the same board as is in this right. anvil case. Right, and it's, it's okay. based on multiplier accumulators. It's got three TRW multiplier accumulators. Okay, and those are right here, huh? Right. And those are, what, 50 nanoseconds? Or? Uh, yeah, it has, the board has a 50 nanosecond instruction time. Oh, uh -huh. So you can do up to three multiplying ads in 50 nanoseconds. This was designed by Kurt Hebel and myself back in 1984, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's still faster than the signal processors out there on the market. Well, my brother so. built a radio with 512 multiply accumulators in it. But, uh, yeah. It does 13 uh, billion operations per second. I call it bops. OK, so are we ready here, or you want to show the um, keyboard? Well, let's see. I still have some more uh, setup to do here. OK. Let's see. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and graph what I'm going to play here. Okay, well, while you're doing that, I think we'll take a break. So okay. um, we'll be right back after this message.
There was a time when hundreds of elephants were being slaughtered every day. Then in 1989, a worldwide ban on ivory was created to protect the elephant families left behind. But in 1992, some countries want to end the ban and will have to wonder what was the point of the last two years. Call the African Wildlife Foundation. Don't let the slaughter start again. <laughs>